Hi, uh, welcome to AMP slash Sustain 353, Sustainability and Culture. We're all in the same class. It's just cross-listed under Anthropology and Sustainability. I'm Savannah Sherman and I'll be the instructor for the course. I'm really excited to be teaching the class this summer and I'm looking forward to the next several weeks with all of you. Today should be a pretty light lecture. Uh, it's largely introductory and an overview of the course. So I'll briefly give you an overview of what the course is gonna be about, introduce myself a little bit more, tell you a bit about my research background and interests. And then we'll talk a little bit about how the course is gonna go, requirements, uh, essentially how you're gonna earn your grade. One thing that um, the summer course is a condensed version of the regular semester long class. And so it's not a lighter version of the class. Um, we will be moving quickly through the material. So plan accordingly. And if you were sort of expecting um, a lighter version of this class, you might consider taking it dur during the regular semester. Um, and with that, I'm excited to have you. So this class, Sustainability and Culture, is all about looking at environmental issues, sustainability through the lens of culture. In other words, we'll be taking an anthropological approach to the topic of sustainability. This push towards a more sustainable world is often understood in a cross-cultural vacuum. In this course, we'll be exploring the historical and cultural diversity of human interactions throughout space and time. Just to give you a brief definition of what culture is, it's those shared and learned patterns of belief and behavior that are passed down generationally among the group. Because culture influences the way in which people think about the world around them and understand the world around them, it drives behavior and also interaction with the environment. And thus, culture is a really useful way to examine what types of ideologies and behaviors lead to sustainable outcomes and which ones do not. So in the class, we'll be exploring this cultural diversity throughout space and time to basically see how have societies interacted with their environment, managed their resources, has it been sustainable or not? In other words, what can we learn from these other societies from different time periods in different places to hopefully inform our own future directions in sustainability? One sort of key takeaway about this class is you cannot understand the environmental problems we face, nor the potential solutions or sustainability without understanding culture. They are inextricably linked. <clears throat> The course is broken down into six broad themes, which correspond to six modules on our Canvas course. So to start us off this week, this first module, we'll be talking about, well, what is the current state of our life support system, the planet? What are the implications of climate change, sea level rise, increasing greenhouse gas emissions for future sustainability? Are our resource use patterns sustainable? Um, how much can, can Earth sort of take while still supporting life as we know it? Also, we'll be looking at what is anthropology and how do anthropologists try to approach and understand human environmental relationships? <clears throat> Secondly, the second module, sort of second week, we'll be looking at the relationship between the environment and human population. You'll often hear people say, we have a population problem, too many people and not enough resources. How many people can the earth support? And is population growth actually the main threat to sustainability? Do we have a population problem or a consumption problem, a distribution problem? For example, a very small proportion of the world's population consumes way more than their fair share of the resources and produces the bulk of the pollution. Do we have a population problem or is that a convenient scapegoat when really what we have is a distribution, a consumption problem? Um, we have resources, people don't have access. 
Then we'll start moving into actual case studies of specific cultures, starting with a critical look at our own type of society here in the US, industrial, post-industrial society. We'll talk about increasing consumption rates and something termed the culture of consumption. Why is consumption on the rise? Um, and the byproduct of all that consumption, depleted resources, increasing pollution, what's driving that? We'll look at industrial food production, um, what, how are we producing our food in this country and why are we doing it that way? For example, um, the main ingredient in Cheese Whiz, Tang, and Cool Whip is corn. Corn is the main ingredient in all of those foods. It gets back to the industrial food system and the way that it has been set up so that it's not really beneficial for society or our health or our environment but it produces a lot of profits for these major sort of corporations, essentially. Um, so why, why, what are we eating and why is it set up this way? Then after taking a critical look at our own society, we'll look at other societies from different places and time periods, um, sort of sustainability cross-culturally. How have other cultures adapted to their environment, organized their societies, managed their resource base, and has it been sustainable or not? What can we learn from these other societies? As we get towards the end of the course, we'll talk about conservation policy and resource management. We'll discuss the rise of national parks and other types of protected areas. Interestingly, um, the goal, right, of national parks is to conserve biodiversity, protect the planet. A lot of these protected areas have not only not done a good job of conserving biodiversity in any significant way, but they've also trampled the rights of local human groups that live in these places, um, namely indigenous groups that have long interacted sustainably on their land, uh, have been kicked out by outsiders in the name of conservation. How do we find ways to manage the environment while not trampling the rights of local people that rely on those environments? Lastly, we'll wrap up the course with sustainability here in the local San Diego region. We'll talk about water use, transportation and automobility, uh, suburban and urban sprawl, are these patterns sustainable? And more importantly, are they inevitable? Do we have to be doing it this way? And the answer is no, it's been designed for us. It's been created this way. Um, for example, often uh, common suggestions to help solve our environmental problems. Let's just take water, for example. Um, first thing that you usually hear um, pops into your head, you know, use less water, take shorter showers, get rid of your lawn, use drought resistant landscapes. Um, that's great. And all these individual actions do matter. But 80% of the water in California goes to agriculture, largely supporting commercial agriculture. So not the small farmer producing healthy, fresh food for us. We can take all the shorter showers we want. Um, and again, it's not that it doesn't matter, but that's never going to address the majority of the cause of our problems, right? 80% of that water goes to agriculture, commercial agriculture. This constant focus on the individual, what can you do? What should we do? Recycle, do this, do that, is what's called the default frame for sustainability. Also termed the individualization of responsibility for environmental problems. It's this constant sort of go-to common suggestions, default suggestions for how to solve our environmental problems. You should do this, use less, recycle, reduce. Um, again, sort of that's great. It doesn't address the major underlying causes of our problems. Take driving, for example. How many of us drive? How many of us that drive have viable alternative trans transport options, right? A lot, I would guess a lot of us don't. We drive because it's sort of the most viable way to get around. This isn't an accident. San Diego used to have a kick-ass, oh, sorry, try not to curse on the first day, oh well, used to have an awesome public transit system. Um, back in the 40s, a company called National City Lines a great documentary about this called Taken for a Ride. This company, National City Lines, which was basically a front company for its subsidiaries, which were General Motors, 
Firestone Tires and California Standard Oil, now Chevron, created national city lines and bought up all the major transit systems in over 100 major U.S. cities and methodically within just a few years destroyed them, dismantled them to make way for the open road for us to all need to drive cars. At the time, nine in 10 people took public transit. That's 90% of the population that's never going to need to buy a car. Car companies basically said, we got we to gotta deal with that. They got rid of public transit. Um, the government actually found sort of the mastermind behind the whole conspiracy guilty. Um, I think they fined him something like $1. Um, we'll talk about it later on in the class. But the point is that we could be designing, organizing our societies more sustainably. There's nothing inevitable about the way things are set up. Um, it's been done purposely by certain individuals and groups, by and large for profit. The good news is that if it's created by people, that means that we can do it differently as well. So that's a little bit about the course. Uh, let me tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, there's lots of different ways to contact me or interact with me throughout our course. One, in addition to asynchronous activities, we'll be holding live class sessions each week on Tuesdays from 11 to 1230. I highly recommend if you can come, come. Um, if you can't, at the very least, you should watch the recording of these live sessions. And if you're not able to come, this is a, by and large an on online asynchronous class. If you're not able to come to our live sessions, no worries. Um, you have a schedule conflict or you have other reasons that you prefer to watch the recording, no problem. It will not count against you in any way whatsoever. Um, I do hope to see you all tomorrow for our first class meeting. It's kind of sort of mandatory. If you can make it, you should come. Um, and if you can't, just reach out to me. Let me know. I also have regular office hours during our summer course, also on Tuesdays from 1 to 2 p.m and also by appointment. So if you can't make my regular hours, contact me, we can set up another time. I'll be holding them on Zoom. You can also contact me via email or Canvas. And all this info is on the syllabus as well. Email works great for short sort of yes, no, couple word answers. For questions that might require a longer answer or a bit of discussion, office hours are great. So I am a cultural anthropologist, and my more recent research was in looking at natural disaster impact and recovery, social inequality, and traditional exchange practices. So I did field work in the Solomon Islands, looking at uh, impact of this large scale earthquake and tsunami that struck the region, and also researching this recovery process, which seemed to be really unequal, and it seemed to be shaped by social factors and specifically these traditional exchange, exchange practices still operating here. To do this research, uh, I do what we call an anthropology fieldwork, meaning I go out and actually live on site in the villages with the people participating in the research and essentially try to immerse myself in the culture. So I'm not there just to ask questions, but also to sort of try and walk in their shoes, experience life from their perspective, um, get it as close as I can, at least. So um, you, I learned the language. I learned Solomon Islands pigeon. You sleep in the village. You eat the food. Go do what they're doing. They have a subsistence economy in Solomon Islands, so they by and large subsist off of fishing and also gardening. A very little cash economy in the country, although that's changing with globalization. Um, so, so here on the slide is some pictures of my field work. Uh, so on the left, <laughs> left, right, on the left is a picture of my research assistant, Carita, and also good friend Tira on the left. This is Titiana. On the right is a picture of some kids in the other main village I worked in, which was called is called Pailange. And on the top there, that's a water spout or a sea tornado that's off the coast of Titiana. Just stuck it in there because it's kind of a cool picture. Um, down on the bottom left, this plant that you're looking at, something called beetle nut. Um, so again, field work, is, you're there to collect data, but also kind of participate. Um, beetle nut, very popular in Solomon Islands. So the, you sort of husk open that green looking shell 
and inside is the beetle nut. You pop it in your mouth. It's not like a normal nut, like a peanut or a cashew. It's um, juicy and kind of bitter. Pop that in your mouth. And then you take um, the, one of these leaves here and dip it in this white powder, which is called lime. It's produced from burnt coral. But what that does when you mix that all up in your mouth, it creates an alkali reaction and uh, it has this mild stimulating effect. Um, so people chew betel nut around the village. Um, interestingly, when you mix the lime and the betel nut together, it turns this really bright red color. Um, and if you chew a lot of it, everything in moderation, uh, it actually will start to stain your teeth a little bit red. And you can see a little bit of that. If you can see um, Tira here on the left, she's a big fan of the betel nut. So you kind of see that red tint on her teeth. You keep chewing it, consistently, it'll back, eventually it kind of rot your teeth out of your head, turn them black. So again, moderation. Oh, this is my first time trying uh, betel nut and um, it is an acquired taste. Get at least one uh, stupid looking picture of me for the course. And so I lived and worked in Solomon Islands in the 2011, 2012 summers researching people's recovery from a tsunami that struck them in 2007. And I'll touch on my work uh, here or there throughout the course. And so I'll just give you a brief idea now what I did out there. For those of you that don't know where Solomon Islands is, it is located just northeast of Australia in the South Pacific. Um, here's its location on the globe, a close-up of the islands, sort of six main land masses, but really hundreds of islands in the archipelago. And then a close-up of the island of Giza, where I spent most of my time. This is where Titiana and Pailange are located, the two main villages I worked in. So on April 2nd, 2007, an 8.1 magnitude earthquake uh, began just about 40 kilometers south of Giza Island. And within minutes, it generated this massive tsunami up to six meters in some places that hit the southern coast of Gizo uh, pretty much right after, within a few minutes. One of the most severe impacts was in Titiana. Titiana is a distinct immigrant community. They're Micronesian and not originally from the Solomon Islands. And basically every structure in the community in the village was, was destroyed, if not heavily damaged. It was wiped out. In addition, uh, there was 13 fatalities in Titiana, the highest death rate in the entire country for any one village. And a lot of, a lot of the deaths were sort of small children, um, also elderly people that essentially couldn't escape when, when the tsunami came. Despite a very similar physical impact in the nearby village of Pailange, which is Melanesian, so they're of the Solomon Island majority, uh, despite a similar impact, no deaths occurred here, luckily. Moreover, the two villages appeared to have experienced a very differential recovery, which seemed to be tied to specific social factors. So what happened? Uh, after the disaster, aid, uh, aid came into the country from foreign governments and non-government organizations, and it was controlled by the Solomon Island government per government policy. So off the bat, much of the aid was misused, misappropriated, and essentially unaccounted for, you know, stolen or, or whatever due to government corruption. So this reduced the amount of aid available to everyone. The remaining aid tended to be distributed in a biased manner that where, where aid received wasn't proportional to impact. So you had some areas that were really heavily affected like Titiana that didn't receive much of anything and other areas that weren't really impacted by the disaster but got lots of aid. The biased distribution of aid seemed to be uh, it's related to this pre-capitalist Melanesian social exchange system called the one talk system. So the word one talk means literally people that are of one talk, people that speak the same language. That one talk is a pidgin word, so sort of one talk. The term more generally refers to people that are related uh, either via kinship, but also via other affiliations. So speaking the same language, right, one talk, or coming from the same place, village or island. <laughs> Excuse me. Within the one talk system, 
people will help their own relatives and one talks before helping more distantly related people. And the Solomon Island government and others involved in the post-disaster aid distribution are not immune to the effects of this culturally ingrained one talk system. So when aid was distributed, it tended to be distributed in a way that favored the one talks and the relatives of those who had power over the distribution. Because Titiana is an immigrant community, they are by and large disconnected from these Melanesian dominated one talk networks based off kinship, shared kinship language in place. Um, and therefore they received very little aid. They ultimately had a much more hindered recovery relative to other areas and were much more vulnerable to the tsunami because of this. <clears throat> it's a good example of another culture quite different from our own. And it's also a good tie into the class. We'll largely be looking at how human interactions with the environment are influenced by social and cultural factors. Um, sustainability, environmental problems, and the solutions do not exist in a vacuum. They are influenced by sociocultural factors. The research is also another a good example of pot a potential example of applied anthropology. So applied anthropology, when we take the knowledge gained from anthropological research and apply that towards actually trying to solve contemporary human problems. In this case, in the case of the Solomon Islands, use this research to help improve future disaster mitigation and recovery in the region. Um, a, a lot of times, aid workers, people involved in humanitarian efforts, these non-government organizations um, want to help and they, they send aid, money, resources, people to, to help after disasters or whatever the situation might be. Um, but they don't realize the importance of the cultural context in which they're working. And so despite their good intentions, it results in a lot of wasted effort, a lot of wasted resources and frustrated people. Um, because again, these outsiders don't take the time or realize how important it is to understand the culture in which you're working. <clears throat> this class is all about understanding how culture influences human behavior and interaction with the environment. Uh, it, culture is key to sustainability. And we, you really cannot understand human impact on the environment, our problems, or our potential solutions without understanding culture. Okay, so enough about me. Um, how about all of you? So for every one of you listening to this, that's three or four other individuals that applied to SDSU but didn't get accepted. The average freshman sort of entering freshman GPA for 2019, 2020, don't look at because of COVID, is, was a 3.97. My point is if you're here, then you have earned a right to be here, right? And you are more than capable than doing, uh, of doing well and succeeding in this class. So I want that to be very clear. That's how I view each of my students. You're right is also a responsibility. So just make sure that you take the class seriously. It's not designed to sort of trick you, um, but you do have to put in the work, the effort to sort of earn your grade and, and do well. Um, so on that note, let's talk just a little bit about uh, how the course is gonna go and then we'll wrap it up. There's two required texts for the course and everything I'm about to say is in the syllabus, which you will be reading if you haven't already. Two books that you need for the course. The first is John Bodley's Anthropology and Contemporary Human Problems. Um, it's sort of the main reader for the course, the main text. And Bodley's focus is on the scale of the culture, how sort of small or large is it? The main argument is that as society moves towards a larger scale, more complex, larger populations, decision-making becomes more and more concentrated in fewer hands. And decision-makers start to, because they're sort of removed from the impact of their decisions and their broader society, because power is so concentrated, they often make decisions or create policies that 
might be beneficial to themselves, but are maladaptive as a whole to the rest of the population or the environment. And this maladaptive behavior and unsustainable practices are not easily corrected. So it'll make more sense when we, once we start getting into it. You'll be reading from it for tomorrow. The second text that you need is by Ben Orlov, and it's an ethnography. Uh, Lines in the Water, Nature and Culture at Lake Titicaca. An ethnography is an, a hallmark tool in anthropology. Uh, it's, a, it's a holistic, all-encompassing account of the life way, the culture of some other group. So we'll be reading an ethnography about fishing villages around Lake Titicaca. And it's a great example of local sustainable resource use um, where these people have managed to maintain much of their traditional culture and traditional resource use patterns, despite external pressures um, and outsiders coming in trying to sort of interfere with that. Uh, we'll, we'll be getting into that after the first exam, so a little bit later in the course. In addition to the two books, uh, we'll be reading some additional articles and book chapters. Everything else is available as PDFs on Canvas for you. It's free. Um, it's all up for you already. Reading. You should complete the reading in close proximity to the corresponding lecture. So either sort of before or after, but close together. Assessment. Grading. Your grade is going to be based off five main things. The first is participation points worth 100 points of your final grade, um, your entire grade, 600 points possible. And so you, when you complete asynchronous activities like asynchronous lectures, video clips, and also discussion board assignments, you'll earn participation points for answering questions or sometimes just for affirming that, yeah, I watched the lecture. We're kind of on the honor system with some of that. Uh, it's to encourage you to cover the material, right? So I'm going to give you points for, for completing it. Participation points for any of the uh, activities, they're always due by the next due date. Um, I'll kind of touch on that again towards the end, but it's always a Thursday or a Sunday at 11.59 p.m. <clears throat> to earn, importantly, to earn points for any of these activities, you need to make sure you watch it, view it, complete it in full, and then also answer any questions that you're asked um, in order to get the point. Concept checks uh, worth 50, 50 points of your final grade. So throughout the course, we'll have these concept checks, basically short quizzes based off particularly the lecture and also the readings to kind of encourage you to make sure you're viewing the lectures and staying up on the readings. There's going to be eight total worth 10 points each. <coughs> It's not designed as a punishment, but to encourage you to engage with the material. And so because of that, I will drop your three lowest scores, almost half. And only five, only your five highest scores are gonna count towards your final grade. Um, and then this way there's some flexibility built in. So if you have a rough day or even week and you weren't able to complete the quiz on time or you weren't able to cover the material for that quiz, there's, there's some flexibility in there. It won't, you won't be penalized for having a legitimate emergency or issue that interferes. Because I drop almost half of your scores, the lowest ones, no makeups. Right. There's room for missing one or two if you have to, although I recommend you, you do them all if you can. Um, no makeups. So and they're always due also on Thursday or Sunday at 1159 p.m. In fact, everything except for the final paper, except for one assignment, always do Thursday or Sunday, 1159 p.m. Um, and it's all in the schedule laid out specifically for you. Films and film reflections. We'll be watching a total of five films and following each film, you'll complete a graded film reflection. Um, they're not super long, sort of short answer, a couple of questions, worth 20 points each for a total of 100 points of your final grade. Unlike the concept checks, none of your film reflection scores are dropped. Um, so make sure you can complete them all on time. They're, they're related to the course material. We're watching them for a reason. And I think you'll actually like them. You'll get something out of them. Also, always do Thursday or Sunday. Exams, three total worth 100 points each for 300 points of your final grade. Um, two parts, multiple choice, 30 or 40 questions, and then an essay. 
um, which you'll be able to prepare in advance before uh, prior to submitting for the exam. I give you the question ahead of time. Is an easier way to say it. Um, we'll talk more about exams as we get closer. No makeup exams. You know when they're available. You know when they're due. So plan accordingly. Exams also always do on Thursday or Sunday, 11.59 p.m. Um, if you do have a legitimate emergency or reason that you are unable to complete the exam by the due date, um, you know, make sure you can get documentation for that, or the doctor's note or um, arrest warrant, whatever. Um, and also make sure that you notify me before that due date passes. So you contact me if you, if you have a problem. And then lastly, um, a final analysis paper worth 50 points of your final grade. The final paper is not a big giant research paper. It's a page or less with a couple of paragraphs and a picture. And it's related to an iter iterative theme in our course that's going to keep coming back up. One, I've actually already alluded to it. It's this default frame for sustainability. Um, how do we solve our environmental problems? Oh, recycle, use less water, take shorter showers, um, drive a hybrid. Great. Um, these, these common default suggestions, it's not that they don't matter, but this consistent focus on the individual, this default go-to, we need to do this, it glosses over the bigger issue. Um, take all the shorter showers you want, 80% of the water in California goes to agriculture. Um, so you'll be finding an example of this individualization of responsibility. It's all around you. It's wherever you are right now, it's, there's probably an example nearby in your kitchen or wherever. Uh, you'll be analyzing your own ethnographic real world, real world example that you find and doing a short sort of analysis, short write up on that. So just stay up on the class. And when it comes time to do the final paper, it should be pretty clear how you're going to go about it. And we'll talk more about that later in the class. This is the only assignment that's not due on a Thursday or a Sunday. It's due kind of the last day of our class, Friday, July 2nd, 1159 p.m. Course tools. Um, so the, the joke on the slide, the changing exam pattern, 1995, answer all the questions, 2000, answer any five, 2005, just select A, B, or C, 2010, just write A or B, 15, um, just read the questions, and by 2020, you know, thanks for coming. Um, so again, the class isn't a trick, but you are going to have to put in the work to sort of earn your grade. Here's some tools to help you succeed. Watch, watch the lectures, come to live classes, um, at the very least watch the recording of those, and then make sure you're covering the asynchronous material as well. A lot of the course material is going to be delivered via the lectures, so it's really important that you cover them. <clears throat> Participation points to encourage you to cover the lectures, the video clips, uh, to participate in the discussions. You'll earn participation points for completing those activities. Reading questions. I provide uh, study questions related to each reading assignment. And you do not need to turn them in, they're for you, uh, but I recommend you fill them out as you do your readings. They should be a helpful tool for you in the course, uh, study in studying for concept checks, these sort of short quizzes, or and also exams. If I'm gonna pull from, uh, when, when, I'm, when I'm making quizzes or exams, um, I, I pull sometimes from these reading questions. So let that be your guide. So you're not trying to remember every single detail that you're reading in the books. They're also good study questions for concept checks and exams, hint, hint. Film questions, for each film we watch five total, I'll provide film questions. You also do not need to turn these in. However, you should definitely take notes on the film questions while you watch the film. Doing so is going to help you immensely when you go to complete your graded film reflection. Canvas. Our course is online and relies on Canvas. It is absolutely critical that you familiarize yourself with our, with our Canvas course. We'll be using it throughout. Um, <clears throat> everything you need for the course, lectures, um, recordings, readings, reading questions, film questions, study guides, a syllabus, all on Canvas, everything outside of those two required texts, all up on Canvas for you. A few things about Canvas. 
make sure that you're checking Canvas announcements and your associated SDSU email. It's, it's vital that you check on that. Otherwise, you're going to miss really important information for our course. So make sure you're checking your SDSU email. Make sure you're checking our Canvas course, um, you know, if not daily, cl close to. Few other things about Canvas, um, tools for you, resources, our homepage is a great asset for you. It's got basic info, quick links to our course, to my office hours, to the syllabus. It's also got summaries of each module and quick links to all the materials. Check out the homepage if you haven't already, should be a good tool for you. Um, modules, the modules on Canvas are also going to be a really critical tool. There's six altogether in terms of the course content. And there's some other modules with study guides, reading questions, stuff like that in them. And the modules are in order. So we'll cover module one. When that one closes come the end of Sunday, module two, two will open up. At the end of module two, module three will open up and so on. Modules one through four are each about a week long. And then modules five and six are shorter, both of them. And so together, they're, they take, they'll take a little less than a week and a half. And so those will both open up for you after the close of module four, since we'll be getting towards the end of the class. Everything in the module is in the order that you should cover the material. And I strongly recommend you cover it in that order. Due dates. There's two due dates per week. And you guessed it, it's Thursday or Sunday, with the exception of the final paper, which is due on a Friday. The course is designed to be flexible um, so that you can kind of work when it's convenient to your schedule. But there are two due dates a week to sort of keep you on track so you don't fall too far behind. Um, for each due date, you'll typically have two assignments due. The exception would be this week. Our first due date is Thursday, 11.59. You just have one thing due this Thursday, uh, our first concept check. So um, in all other cases, there's sort of two things due per due date. Make sure you've covered all the material that proceeds in the modules that precedes those assignments. And then our syllabus. You, you have to read the syllabus. It's critical that you read it. It's got really important info about how the course is going to go. Um, our schedule is also inside the syllabus. So read it, read it, read it. I cannot stress that enough to encourage you to read it. Though there, there's going to be questions about our syllabus on our first concept check, our first quiz, which is due this coming Thursday. Schedule is tentative, but not much will change. If, if anything gets tweaked, I'll give you advance notice and it'll pr probably benefit you, um, if anything. Just a few other things before we wrap up. Um, some tips and suggestions for how to succeed in our course. And this is also in the syllabus. Attend class. Um, at the least, watch the recording if you can't attend. Make sure you cover the asynchronous material as well. Stay up on the material and keep pace with it. Um, don't fall far behind. We're going to be moving quickly. Plan accordingly. The course, again, is designed to be flexible and accommodate different schedules. However, plan accordingly, right? Thursdays and Sundays are the due dates, so plan ahead. Check Canvas. Um, obviously, I've said these things already. It's because they're really important, so make sure you're doing these things. Check Canvas. Check our announcements. Check your SDSU email regularly. Our course depends on it. Communicate with me when needed and know that I'm here to help. We, we are living in extraordinary times. And if you're struggling in our class or facing challenges, I likely won't know about it unless you come and talk to me. And I'll never ask you anything personal or private, but if you need additional resources or additional support uh, or you know, help from the SDSU community, I hope that you'll feel comfortable in letting me know. Okay, so communicate with me when needed. Accessibility. If something in our course is not accessible to you, please reach out and let me know. It's really important to me that everything is accessible to each of you. Um, for most things, there's alternative formats, um, different ways that you can get to the same material. If something's not working for you, please, please let me know. Um, and lastly, uh, just be responsible. This is a professional environment. 
So treat it as such, and we shouldn't have any issues. You know, communicate as adults and professionals, treat each other courteously. Our classroom should be a safe space for all of us to discuss our perceptions, our experiences, our examples. Um, just be respectful to one another. And I know that we will. A few other last things. Don't cheat. See the syllabus on the policy. Fail the assignment. Fail the course. Plus um, further consequences. Just don't do it. It's totally not worth it. Um, and usually it takes longer than just doing the work. So don't cheat. If you're struggling in the class, the time to come talk to me is now. Don't wait until the last week or few days or few weeks of the class. At that point, there's not much I can do to help because you've already kind of taken the class. Um, come talk to me early on if you find yourself in that situation. And let's see, lastly, uh, grades aren't curved. Um, you have everything you need to earn the score that you want. The cutoffs on the grades and the points are in the syllabus. So you, you are assigned the score that you earn. Um, work hard and you should do well. Okay, so <clears throat> to begin our discussion on sustainability, we're gonna be watching a clip, The Planet is Fine by George Carlin. George Carlin was a comedian, um, for those of you that aren't familiar with him, and he does like to say fuck a lot, uh, so just beware. He, uh, so go when you get done with this lecture, go watch the clip, it's seven minutes, it's up on Canvas for you, and as you watch it, uh, you, at the end, you'll be prompted to answer a question about it. Answer that question, watch the clip in full, answer the question, and you'll earn five participation points for doing that. Also, after you go watch the clip, um, you should complete the participation point assignment for this lecture. So the same page on Canvas that you went to to watch this lecture, go back to that same page. And if you scroll below the link to the lecture, there's a link to this lecture's assignment. Click on it. It's a true false question. Did you complete the lecture? True. Uh, earn points for having completed it. Everything else you need is, aside from the two books, is up on Canvas for you. Um, read the syllabus and come to class for our first sort of live kickoff. And uh, we'll dive in with the current state of the environment. I'm looking forward to it. Have a great rest of your day and I'll see you soon.